what do you think either Arrested Development's place is in comedy history or your place in comedy history? Oh, I have no place in comedy history. That's a <laughs> ridiculous, absurd question. But I would say what, 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 what Arrested will be is, I, I think, more point, I, I, as we were writing it, I, I would say, you know, this will show might not ever get a giant audience. But people who want to get into comedy, this will be their favorite show. This will be the show that helps them say, oh, my God, I can do that. Oh, I didn't see that coming. I didn't see that coming. Or, wow, what a great way of doing that. And, and, and that has kind of proven to be true. I know a lot of young writers who are like, oh, my God, arrested. And it's like, good, it's done its job. It's indoctrinated another person into comedy. And right now, I can, I can sit back and I can watch. You know, I mean, comedy has, has gotten much better. The hard comedy jokes, the multi-cam things, you know, we made about a million of them. Maybe, you know, maybe it's time we put that formula to rest. You know, we're find, you know, we're find a new way of doing it. If if Arrested has a legacy, it's going to be like it inspired a lot of good comedy writers. My name is Jim Vallely. Maybe you've enjoyed some of the shows I've written, like Golden Girls and Arrested Development, um, and maybe you haven't. Hey, Harmon, let's get to work. Yes, as you just heard, that is the voice of the great Jim Valerie, and you've tuned into another episode of Comedy History 101, where we school you in comedy. I am Harmon, hello, and I am delighted to have Jim as our guest today. And as you just heard, Jim was a writer and producer on the iconic comedy show, Arrested Development, which he won a primetime Emmy for. And he's worked on numerous esteemed shows such as The Golden Girls, Two and a Half Men, The John Larroquette Show. And his comedy streams all the way back from appearances on The Tonight Show with his comedy duo, The Funny Boys. And we are going to do a deep dive into Jim's comedy history. But before we jump into the episode, a few quick plugs. On Thursday, October 19th, 9 p.m. at Young Ethel's in Park Slope, I'll be producing my show, That 80s Improv Challenge, and it's a special theme show, Fast Food Training Video Edition. (laughs) Yes, three improv teams compete by creating scenes inspired by fast food training videos from the 1980s. And on Tuesday, October 1st, At the Santa Cruz Comedy Festival, my show AI vs. Human Roast Battle is the opening night show. So if you are in Santa Cruz, come out and see a human comedian take on a machine learning AI in a comedy roast battle of tomorrow. And that show will be back in New York on October 6th, 7 p.m. at the People's Improv Theater. And you can find out more about my show dates at Harmon Leon on the social medias or on my site, HarmonLeon.com. Also, friends, if you like or even tolerate Comedy History 101, give us a few stars. Show your love by giving us a few stars on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Or comment on our site, ComedyHistory101.com. Every little bit helps, and we love bringing you such great shows as the episode we have today. And now, without further ado... You're stupid. Everybody's so stupid. I'm trying to use the phone! Excuse me! Comedy History 101. Jim, how are you? How are you? How are you? Good. I'm out in New York. This is Comedy History 101. Your comedy history is East Coast, because uh, didn't you grow up in uh, New Brunswick? Yeah, well, well New Br- East Brunswick. Well, you know, I was born in New Brunswick. And uh, yeah, so, so you know, was born a long, long time ago, 70 years ago, believe it or not. Oh, wow. I graduated high school in 72, and I got into NYU. And uh, but after I went to a county college for a couple of years, because, you know, the idea of like in, in like the early 70s, I thought, I'm going to go into show business. 
<laughs> it was just, you know, and, you know, my mother did everything she could to keep me out, you know, including hiding my uh, acceptance letter from NYU. And were you, were you in the <laughs> acting department there or the film department or writing department? Yeah, I, I, I studied with, with Stella Adler. The Stella, the Stella yes. Adler. And she would come into our into a room. And she had a throne on her little stage there. And we all had to stand up and it was very, very, uh, you know, insane. As a matter of fact, there's a good documentary about Stella Adler and an American Masters. And I'm looking at this documentary and I go, yeah, this is, this is a city center, her little, her little studio there. And then I realized, oh, wait, I was in this class. Whoa. You know, I'm such a pothead. I forgot that, like, I had to sign an NDA. I'm, like, looking at, like, you know, Jody Price, who's, like, Lonnie Price's sister, doing a scene. And then, of course, I was so young when I was, was in the acting class. You don't get anything out of it. When you're 18 or 19, nobody can teach a 19-year-old kid anything. And I, I went back... Uh, and she she had written a thing called what was it called? It was a sort of, sort of a master class and uh, script interpretation, uh -huh. and it really gave me the basis on on, on how to write something because it was like you know all the actors, all the stuff like an actor needs an action. Why are they there? A lot of the times, and she was coming from more of a theatrical yeah. point of view, but she goes. A lot of times characters are in rooms and, you know, they're just there to, you know, a maid is just there to pick up the phone. But, you know, you've got to put another reason. What does that person want all the time? And when I'm writing, I'm always, you know, I'm not I don't know, a great writer, but I'm like, wait, okay, what do they want? <laughs> yeah, well. You want an Emmy? <laughs> That's pretty good. Okay. <laughs> don't, well, don't undersell yourself. You know, <laughs> it's, 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 a, it's a really a, a bit of a crapshoot out here as to what shows you get put on, you know? And knowing when you're on a good show, and I was lucky, you know, because you le really learn on your first shows. I, you know, like the first big show I did was Golden Girls, and you really learn, like, if you've written a bad joke, you know, if B. Arthur can't get a laugh with your joke, you've written a bad joke. <laughs> and, but if you're writing for, I don't know, I'm gonna, I'll just pull it out, Tony Danza. Uh -huh. You know, Tony Danza takes a bad joke and he turns it into a Tony Danza joke. You know, he also takes a good joke and he turns it into a Tony Danza joke. So, and he, and Tony Danza's whole thing was like, he was like a walking laugh track for his own lines. You know, he would do his line. That was just in the lobby. <laughs> he kind of laugh after. <laughs> it's a little trick, you know. Um, but I learned, it's like, okay, yeah, that's a good joke. Why didn't that joke work? And so I was, that was a real college for me those couple of years. What, what about, though, just going back to actual college, college, you know, when, when did you start uh, with uh, the Funny Boys, which was your first, was that your first, did you go solo? Like in stand up or always a team? I never went solo. I found myself, you know, I, I was a young dad, a beautiful daughter, and who also works in the industry. We found ourselves living in this, in this building in Manhattan called Manhattan Plaza, which was for actors and writers. It was, it was kind of amazing. It was on 42nd Street. They were these luxury buildings that went up. Somebody thought people would want to live on 42nd Street in the late 70s where you have nothing but prostitutes and drugs. It's just, you know, but these two buildings went up. Yeah, the, the deuce. Right, exa exactly right. It was the deuce. I think, I think is, this building is even mentioned in the deuce because they put these buildings up and no, no one wanted to rent there. So it went over to HUD. They took over and Estelle Parsons, a great actress, said, you know, I know a group of poor people who would love to live in a theater district. They're called actors and writers. <laughs> and, what. and so we got in. And that was like big for me because down the hall lived Larry David and across the hall from Larry lived the great Kenny Kramer. <laughs> Samuel Jackson was our security guard. Whoa. <laughs> and there were nothing but actors and writers all around you. And that really got me into, okay, you know, I needed something to do at night. So I called up a guy who I went to uh, NYU with, uh, Jonathan Schmack, very talented actor. And he could do voices and whatnot. And we had done some stuff, like cabaret stuff, but we decided to give it a shot. We were at Catch Rising Star in the comic strip, and they flew us out, and they, you know, we auditioned for NBC. It was a big deal. What, what club in New York was the first time you got on stage? Probably the comic strip. Okay, still still there? It's still in operation? Oh, yeah, 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 yes, yeah, yeah. Seinfeld passed us. He was like the house MC. Oh, wow. Then we got at Catch a Rising Star. And uh, you know, and that's where I became good friends with Bill Maher. Yeah, and you know, you, you get your you get your group of guys. That was just timing. Timing is a big part of it. Yeah. What was it like in those early days of uh, New York stand up? Was it was it a pretty close knit 
group? Because here it's like every bar has about 10 different shows and that's just like one bar. It was it was a small group. I would say, you know, catch, comic strip, improv, the, and, and then the comedy seller joined like 84, 85. And there were maybe a, maybe a 80 or 100 comics and you know so it was a very small group of people and we all got to know each other because we all did gigs we did the you know the one-nighters and college gigs together and everybody kind of knew and there was a real camaraderie to it you know you know of course you know a camaraderie covering um seething hatred jealousy anger why him why not me you know and you know but you learned how to like pretend to be happy for your friends when they got their tonight show spot <laughs> because that was that was that was the goal back then well then it's just like okay you have just the three the three networks yeah and you have the one tonight show yeah so it's just like when someone gets a tonight show it's just like it's a career changer yeah it was a career changing thing yeah and at what point in 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 your stand-up career like how many years in when you got on the tonight show which i just watched the two clips yesterday it's always nice when we have uh, comedians, especially new comedians who have not appeared nationally before, to come out and have an audience like we have tonight, because it, it, it helps them. Uh, there are two young fellows who got started at a place called Catch a Rising Star in New York. They work frequently at the improvisation in Hollywood. Their names are Jonathan Schmuck and Jim Vallely, and they bill themselves as the funny boys. Here they are. We got in, we'd probably been doing it for three or four years. You know, I think, you know, we, we did it for a year and then took, took some time off to reevaluate and then got back into it. And that second time that we got back into it, we got a little more serious. And then we just got lucky. You know, we, we, we did a show at a place called Green Street downtown and we got great reviews. And, you know, literally the next day, within like a month, we were, we had an overall deal at NBC and did a television series, did a pilot. Did, actually did a pilot with Jessica Walter. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, in 84. You know, it was it was different back then. I mean, it almost, if you look at a lot of, uh, certainly like the sitcoms from the from the 80s, they almost look like public access. <laughs> so <laughs> Yeah, like just, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a huge fan of opening credit sequences on 80s sitcoms. <laughs> oh, you got to look at ours. And thus, thus, it was a treat when I was researching and watching Double Trouble. <laughs> Double Trouble, Double Trouble is definitely what, and then John. It, it, always ha it always has this one where they're talking and then they look at the camera. <laughs> oh, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, there, there was a formula and you had to follow that formula. The pilot that Jonathan and I did, it was, this is how corny it was. It was like 84. Four. And, the, and the premise was we were two guys, two friends, who just got out of the army. <laughs> and um, one of them decides to go to nursing school. Mm -hmm. Me. I decided to go to nursing school. And it's so weird because I'm a male nurse. It doesn't exist. It's like, Why could a man want to be a nurse? A man. It doesn't. <laughs> so. <laughs> What's going on here? <laughs> it's, it was crazy. And of course, Jonathan, he just likes to get you know, on. <laughs> and Jessica Walters, the stern dean, as we, they just made up this world that doesn't exist, you know, that. <laughs> Nurses live in a giant nurse college with deans of nursing, and they all have to be virgins to be nurses. <laughs> and, but it was, but the show was good enough that you know they they put us on another show, and I, I, we did one day at a time. But those, it was like a big deal. It's like you, you would do a show, and then you know, fifteen twenty million people will have seen it. You know, you were kind of like we, we were we were well known for about a month, <laughs> I would say, because ah. they took they they canceled Double Trouble. And then they put it back on in reruns, which they, they don't do anymore. Uh, they, they, once the show is canceled, it's canceled. Because our show, they put it on, and they put it on a different time, on a different day. They put it on after the Facts of Life on Wednesdays and reruns. And we became like the number two show in the country. And they, and they desperately wanted to, you know, bring the show back. But the the, the the twins didn't want to do it anymore. Yeah, and also I researched the twins. They went on to be kind of real hardworking director and producer. Oh, they're great! Like Son of Anarchy and, and shows like that. Well, yeah, they're 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 just amazing. Jeannie is a director. I, I worked with her on Two and a Half Men three, recently. Well, not recently, that's ten years ago. Hmm. <laughs> um, you know, uh, and Jeannie and and Liz, you know, wrote for Santa, uh, Sons of Anarchy and. Uh, 
We were pretty close to those girls. Those girls are amazing. And then at the same time, you were still doing like uh, touring and doing sets at the comedy store. Oh, yeah. What was that That crazy early days of the Mitzi Shore early 80s like comedy store? Would it be like you get bumped by Richard Pryor or things like that? Or <laughs> you know, Actually, Richard Pryor, well, the first time I played the comedy store was the audition for Brandon Tartikoff, who ran NBC. And, and there was a mistake because Richard Pryor was was doing this, the original room that night. He was performing there, and he was sitting in the back. And you know the the comedy store; it's a small room. And we had never gotten in, but they said, "Listen, there's two acts that we want to see." And Pryor went to Tartikoff. Yeah, okay, these two acts can go up. Pryor says so. The other act went up, did very good. We had to follow the other act. We did okay. And then Pryor came up on stage and turned to uh, Brandon Tartikoff and said. Basically, we were hard acts to follow. He used a little more colorful language, and it wasn't true at all. He <laughs> used Richard Pryor. Yeah. But yeah. what had happened was, you know, when, when you have a star sitting in the back of Richard Pryor, the act isn't looking at you. They're, they're, looking, they're looking at Richard Pryor to see when he's going to go on. They don't want to see us, right? And the other act, of course, was Jim Carrey. Oh, okay, and, there you uh, go. <laughs> and, 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 so, and so he got, you know, we, but we got overall deals. And I think maybe because of Richard Pryor, because he was just such a gentleman to us, because he knew he was splitting focus. He knew that we weren't getting the, the performance that we deserved because he was sitting in the back. You know, I've made all this up in my head. It, it's, it's, I'm, I'm attributing uh, things, but uh, that was a big. It was a big deal in like 1984 to to get a, it. Changed your, it changed our lives. I mean, you know, we got like enough money to move out here because that's the hardest thing to do. I'm trying to use the phone. So you you were still living in New York at the time when you got double trouble, or oh yeah, and commuting back and forth, or uh, we, we we flew out for the deal. I mean, for the for the audition, we we got like enough money to you know move out here, get an apartment. Within a month, we were out here, and and then they gave us a TV series. They gave us a pilot. And were, were you guys like on the road? Were you like road comic doing the whole just circuit thing? Yeah, well, we were lucky because you know there were there was that big war between the improv and the comedy store, mm. and we were doing both. And then Mitzi Shore got who we ran the comedy store, got a hold of it, and she called us up. Luckily, I was prepared. Because she was like, I hear that you're working the improv. I won't do the impression. <laughs> um, I, I, I hear that you're working the improv. Um, you got you to gotta choose one or the other. Aye. And I said, and I said um, well, could you give us twice as many spots like in the original room? Because we are two people. And, uh, you know, we're not like the Three Stooges or Abbott and Costello, you know. <laughs> we don't live together. We don't sleep together. We don't finish each other's snores, you know. <laughs> and, and I said, and, and I go, and I have a kid. And she goes, that, that got to her. And she says, okay, you can, you, can, you, know, you can play both clubs. And then how long did you guys stay together? And, and Jonathan, for comedy history fans who are the listeners, you know, we love him as the snooty maitre d' and... Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Uh, actually, yeah, John Hughes liked us. We were supposed to be in Ferris Bueller's Day Off as the, um, do you remember, there's a couple of guys who uh, who take the car out. Yeah, one is uh, the guy from, uh, what's his name, uh, Richard Edison from uh, Jim Jarmusch's Stranger Than Paradise, who also was in Good Morning Vietnam. TMI. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, uh, this is, Well, this is Comedy History 101. Well, <laughs> by the way, they, they shot like, 20 minutes of those guys, the car has a whole adventure in Ferris Bueller's Day Off. And, but the, but they didn't use it because, you know, it's like, yeah, we don't need it. We got this, you know, lightning in a bottle with, uh, you know, Matthew Broderick. And they, they, they wanted us to be the valet guys, but, you know, they wanted to go another way with it. And they said, so there's only one role left, Jonathan for the Mater D. And I went, well, I can't act. <laughs> so, jo Jonathan, please. Ah. And I'm really glad he did it because it was, it was really... And they, then they put us in another John Hughes movie. We have a small part in um, Some Kind of Wonderful, where we are. We, we actually are car valets. Oh. I, I, guess, I guess John just thought we were good car valets. <laughs> yeah, that he was working on his next movie, uh, Car Valet. Car Valet. <laughs> but, well, actually, th this is totally true. And he said, you know, I'm thinking... This is how... how far back it was because when we met him he wasn't john hughes yet he had he was i met him when he was in the in the adr session for uh 16 candles i think he had written vacation and i think he had written mr mom but um i i think that i think that was his first directing 
job was 16 candles. And that's when they really saw that, you know, this guy just was amazing. But then he said to us at one point, I have an idea for like two guys who meet. He, he liked comedy teams and he thought that we were going to be the next big comedy team. So he clearly wasn't always right about everything. <laughs> and um, <laughs> But he basically pitched us playing strains and automobiles. Ah. But by the time he got to that, it was like, well, I can get Steve Martin and John Candy. <laughs> so You've worked with such icons. And one cred that I, I think is very cool is uh, you worked on uh, Michael Nesmith's TV parts. Television parts, yeah. Yeah, that was part of that first NBC deal that we had. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, that was that was a show that was, you know, the proverbial ahead of its time. He wanted to do, and it's worth seeing. I think, it's, I think you can get them on something called uh, Dr. Duck's Medicine Sauce or something like that. But I actually met quite a few people, John Levenstein, who would go on to write with us on uh, Arrested Development. A lot a lot of guys from that show, a guy named Bill Martin, who wrote Harry and the Hendersons. And yeah, it was it was it was you know, comedy videos. That's what he was he was into. That was that was interesting. That was like the first time I actually had to sit down and write something that wasn't like, you know, for the act. You know, because yeah, I never thought of myself as a writer. I just got there out of uh, need. <laughs> yeah, and just to segue into like from going to stand up to writing, what skills did you learn just that you could pass on to people starting out in stand up that were applicable from everything from you know writing on a TV show to producing? You you just have to find you know your comedy voice, and I, I guess that kind of means practicing it all the time. It's probably changed. Probably the talent that I possess, which is I can say a line really quickly, loudly in a room and cut through everybody else. And I might get there a half a second earlier, <laughs> but those half a seconds add up. And I only can say about comedy because, you know, you know, rewriting is really important. Being able to make yourself laugh is really important. Really not caring is important. Uh, getting used to failure. Failure should be just like a comfortable shawl that you constantly wear with you. Know that you're going to get rejected 99.9999999999% of the time. That's, you know, you, you just have to develop your voice. And I think that the best thing that you can do to exercise that muscle, for me, is just like, just try to crack jokes, you know, when appropriate, you know, if you can, kind of find out, you know, uh, who who your audience is. Everybody's got like a different sort of level of humor that they like. And I don't even want to say level, like it's a up or down thing. It's more of a linear thing. But, you know, some people like their comedy physical. Some people like it clean. Some people like puns. I'll never understand those people. But I can make a pun. I can know how to make yeah. it. Just if you're going to do comedy, it helps become a funny person. Now, that's all that helped me. I know a lot of comedy writers that aren't funny in real life. Quite a few of them. All of them. <laughs> I have found that what, what has kept me working is the ability to be in a room and, and also to be positive too. You know, you know, it, it, it is a little race that we all have when we're looking for a line on your market set joke, you know, somebody get it. And when somebody else gets there, it's, it's, it's important to go, you won. And also don't pitch after a joke has gotten in. Write your joke down and pray that the joke they got in dies. <laughs> um, so you have the one behind it. But um, that's, my, that's, that, that's my general advice. Just, I, I, I did nothing right. I did, I, I did not do the traditional way of getting into a writer's room. I never had illusions that I would get into a writer's room. You know, that was like, you know, you had to get to Yale or Harvard, you know, those guys. So I never said, this is what I want to do. But when I, when, as soon as I got there, I was like, this is what I can do. Yeah, I can do. Yeah. Comedy History 101 will be right back. It was was the Golden Girls, was that the first time you were actually like in writer's room and scripting? Basically, yeah. Yeah, that was like the first big one. And uh, and, I, and I was totally broke. <laughs> I had like no money. Uh, Jonathan's acting career had taken off. And so we hadn't worked in a few years together on, you know, amiably, you know. And, uh, and so I was just, I was incredibly desperate. <laughs> I was 34 years old and I had no money and nothing really lights that fire <laughs> like um, having no money. <laughs> so, you know, you just, you, you, you get a do or die moment. I had a two-week option 
on the show. He said, we're going to see me for two weeks. And at the end of that two weeks. W was it an agent that brought you into the show? Or was it just people you knew? Or No, the, the great Don Rio, who was the producer of the Double Trouble Twin Show. Ah. And on, on set, I would always add lib lines. Hey, Don, Don, I got a joke. Then when we stopped, Jonathan and I didn't want to do it anymore. I was working for a while, but the show I was on as an actor got canceled. It's called Hard Knocks, starring a guy named Bill Maher. Ah. Yep. And so Bill, and then it was produced by Chris Thompson, who, who had done Bosom Buddies, and he was a good mentor and important part of my life. And then, uh, then I just, but after Jonathan and I didn't work together for about a year, I, I started a rumor <laughs> that I was writing. I was just telling, because mm -hmm. people, you know, that awful thing when you're not working and nothing's happening, but you have to go to the club and, you know, put on your, your brave, you know, everything's going great. <laughs> yeah, right. Face and people were saying, "What are you doing?" Oh, I'm writing now. I'm writing. Yeah, I'm writing. I'm writing. And then one day I get a call from Don. He goes, "Jimmy, I hear you're writing now." And I said, "Oh yeah, yeah." <laughs> and he goes, "Come on in. I got. I'm doing. He did a show with Brian Keith. Yeah, that's, you remember the sullen, mean, face tugging, angry method actor Brian Keith, who always for some reason got put in comedies. He's like the least funniest guy in the world. <laughs> He's like, and uh Well you need the straight man foil. <laughs> yeah, but but it was the same producers as the Golden Girls. They said, We're Thomas. So Don puts me I'm the only writer on the on the staff. It's it's a very low budget show. And Don and I are working on it and I and then we go into the booth and that's where Paul Witt and Tony Thomas, Witt Thomas, are and, and at this point, this is like mid '80s, like '87. You know, they've got Golden Girls, they've got Emptiness, they've got, you know, they, they're they're really at the top of their game. And I'm making them laugh. I go, if I can make these guys laugh in the booth, maybe they'll ask me on a Golden Girls, right? <laughs> and of course, the show gets canceled. So I'm sitting in my little cubby hole office. I got this tiny little closet of an office, and uh, feeling sorry for myself. <laughs> I, you know, light up a big poor me joint. And smoke at this joint and Paul Witt just comes into my office, you know, five thousand dollar suit, blah, 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 looks at me. I got the joint in my hand. I look at him, I said, Well, you just thought I was funny? <laughs> and, <laughs> and he goes, Ah, oh, we're gonna have you back. And that's how I got the job on the Golden Girls. But it's it's a very unorthodox way of doing it. Because I remember there was a couple of months between that joke that I made and Golden Girls. And I, I did have an agent who said, did you want to write a script, uh, a spec script of the Golden Girls that we could submit to them? And I said, why? So I can, you know, tell them I don't know how to write a script. <laughs> you know, <laughs> no, I'll take my chances. And then I actually did kind of a ballsy thing. I did. I said, but set up a meeting. And I set up a meeting with Paul Witt and Tony Thomas. And they let me in. Jim, how are you? Good, good to see you. And I said, listen, um, about uh, three or four months ago, Paul said, uh, you know, we're going to have you back. And they go, yes, yes, yes. I go, yeah, well, that's the meeting. <laughs> I walked oh, okay. away. They, they just cracked up. They just thought, I go, that's really, that's, that's what I got for you. <laughs> and they left. And like a couple of days later, I got a call to come and do Golden Girls. And that changed my life. Was there different levels of like writing, like when you first start, like jump in to like a show? Well, yeah, no, no, you start, you start, you start as a staff writer. Like, there's like a, mm -hmm. there's about twenty episodes of Golden Girls where my name is somewhere in the credits, but you know, it always doesn't represent what you bring to to the show and whatnot. And right, right away, I I had the voice for that show because my mother was like a golden girl and she was sarcastic. All you have to do is be. Can you be mean and sarcastic and talk like an old lady? Yeah. <laughs> it's, my, it's my wheelhouse. So, <laughs> so you know, I, I, I just lucked into there. And also there's this like, you know, don't ever underestimate what being broke <laughs> can can do. Because I, I, I have found over the years that people who have reached some success, it's harder for them to, to get going, you know. And especially if you've had success because, once again, you, it's very hard to go back to hearing no. Uh -huh. You know, nobody likes to hear no. Uh, but me, I'm... I love it. I hear it all the time. There certainly there was there was there just was animosity between B and Betty at some times, but I think it was more of a clash of styles. Betty was a performer. B was an actor, and you know Betty 
knew some tricks. Maybe Betty wasn't the best actress in the world. B was a great actress, you know, and a, and a great comedic act, actress. And like I say, you know, Betty was a performer, but the audience loved Betty White. Mm-hmm. They always loved Betty White. And I, I, you know, I don't know what, what that conflict was between them. It was there. It was light. Nobody took it seriously. I don't think they took it seriously. You know, I was on the show for, you know, about 95 episodes. There's no other definition of professionalism than what those women could do. You know, I mean, this is when the shows were like 24 minutes long. That's an extra two minutes of dialogue. Very little guest cast. Those women were on camera all the time. And they weren't they weren't as old as, as people think they were. They were basically in their 50s, early 60s. We would do like a live show uh, at 5 o'clock, I think 4 o'clock on Fridays. You wouldn't stop. You would just go through it. You tape it, but you just go through it. And and mistakes and all. Somebody had a mistake. You would just go, wait, line. And then and they would do that, right? And then we'd all have dinner. And they would get their notes in front of everybody. Because everybody, it was a quicker way of doing it. If you're going to change a line, you have to let everybody know at the same time. And we're all together having dinner, which was kind of a sweet way of doing it. Uh, I, I, don't, I haven't worked on any of the shows or any company that did that, but it was a great way of doing it. But you're also giving your actors acting notes in front of the entire cast and crew. I remember once, B hardly ever got, got line readings, right? Remember Wayne's World, they had that great show, Not, right? Yeah. Of a not, and everybody was doing a, a not rip off joke. They would just do not somewhere, right? That was the joke that year. Yeah. But the thing about the Golden Girls is, we could do it like a year later, and it would be like, yeah, the old ladies just got this reference, right? So, I had written the script, and I gave B. Arthur a, a, a not joke, right? And it was something along the line, like, you know, she says to Betty, oh, and, and Rose, I think that you're the smartest, most intelligent woman I've ever met. Not. That was the <laughs> joke, right? So she does the first one, right? And B does it. And I think you're the most intelligent woman I've ever met. Not! <laughs> she screams not. <laughs> I fall out of my chair. I think this is the funniest thing. And the showrunner was Mark Sotkin. And... Paul, I knew Paul Witt was the, because we, we all watch it in the booth, like away from the actors. And uh, Paul goes, uh, let's get that, you know, one on the night show less, you know. <laughs> Bring it down. Go, not! <laughs> not! <laughs> so, so poor Mark Sockett's got to give the note, right? And to be, and B didn't get a lot of notes, right? So I was like, okay, uh, B, uh, page uh, 30. Uh-huh. <laughs> um, the not joke. Yeah, really funny, B. Really funny. We love it. So good. Hey, maybe this next time, let's take it down a little bit. Okay. <laughs> Before the show, I, I go down to get a little muffin or something at the craft service, and I see B there, and I muster my courage, and I go, hey, B, I just, I just want to tell you, I go, I, I love the way you did the not joke. <laughs> she says, yeah, well... So did I. <laughs> and then Mark Sotkin cut my balls off. <laughs> <laughs> That's my favorite BZ story. But, you know, she was, you know, th- that, that show was just, we were just so lucky to be working on that show. Just so lucky to be working on that show. Learned a lot. And you mentioned like uh, some of your comedy heroes uh, or shows that were very influential to you. Uh, you know, one of them being the Dick Van Dyke show. Yeah. And you actually got to work with, Carl Reiner. I did get to work with Carl Reiner, and this is kind of interesting. Um, uh, well, everybody got to work with Carl Reiner; he was great. But you know, when I was a kid, I guess the one thing that did that that did unconsciously prepare me for a job writing this was, uh, and uh, when I was twelve years old, they I, I got sick and I stayed home from school for a year, right? So I was watching a lot of television, and in and and kids didn't stay home for school, you know. But in the morning, they would have all these sitcoms on, and one of them was Dick Van Dyke. And after a while, you begin to see, oh, there's a pattern here. I'm getting it. I'm getting it. Yeah. But I just saw all these all these shows. But Dick Van Dyke, of course, was my favorite because it was like, wow, can you imagine? You, you can't. How? Well, it's a writer's. How do you? Yeah, how do you get that job? How you know? Yeah. And it was just, it was just so far away, right? 
But you know, and, 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 but, I, but I knew all the names. I knew Carl Reiner. He had a lot to do with that, you know. And he played Alan Brady, of course, and Alan Brady, the egomaniacal Sid Caesar-like host of the show. And so, <laughs> we're, and, and and his character, Alan Brady, was just a you know, he was a cocksucker. He was you know, a mean guy, right? <laughs> and so I'm doing this show with, with I'm doing Two and a Half Men, and he's on it. And of course, all the you know, the the writers are like Carl, 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 and Carl is very nice to the writers. You know, he comes in Monday, great job! Oh my God, the script is amazing. This is so good. He's so nice, right? And he's just very complimentary. And so we we get into the Friday night taping, and we're having dinner. And I go, you know, this joke on page whatever doesn't work. You know, let's let's come up with something better for Carl. And it's just one of those box canyon jokes you can't get out of. I pitch something kind of lame. You know, and it was okay. Yeah, that's a, that's better. That's better, right? Uh, the joke was about you know Carl Ryder was like you know he was, he was like about ninety five at the time, and somebody said you know what about Saturday? Can you demand? And he goes, no, it's my mother's birthday. That was the joke, right? right? <laughs> birthday party for some like that. So, but now it's like nine o'clock at night, and we, we somebody goes running in the the, the new joke for Carl at nine o'clock at night. Oh, no. Carl's not quite so nice, you know. He's he's a little like grumpier, and he was like, "What? What's this?" And he goes, "Huh, uh, mother? No, 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 no. It's, it's it's too much of a thinker." And then he goes, "Wait, let let me rephrase that. It's not a thinker. It's a stinker." Okay, what the fuck are you guys doing? Jesus Christ, it's nine o'clock at night, and all the other writers are backing up, except me. I'm standing there because I know this is all for me, right? And basically, Carl Reiner leaves, and Alan Brady appears, you know? And he's like, God damn it, Jesus Christ, you know, let's go with the goddamn joke we have. What are you throwing stuff like this? <laughs> But I was so you, you felt like you were in the middle with with, with uh, I go I, I got my dream I'm being, yeah I'm just standing <laughs> yeah. there I'm just standing all the young writers are gone I go no this is part of the job mm -hmm. yeah you're right it's a stinker it's a stinker <laughs> right. so, but that was sort of like a little a little dream come true and this is why I think I'm happy about it because no matter how you know who you are as you get older. You know the opportunities shrivel up. Not yeah, you know, not so much for Carl Reiner, but Carl Reiner is like he he has to be nice all the time. You know, because you don't want to hear that Carl Reiner isn't nice, and Carl Reiner is nice all the time. But it's really hard to be nice all the time. Mm -hmm. And when you're the boss, one of the good things about being the boss once in a while is you get to say what the fuck, you know. And so I felt. That I helped with my with my lame, terrible joke. I helped give Carl Reiner maybe one of his last moments of publicly being mean to writers, <laughs> 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 because I think he was really a lot like Alan Brady in some ways. I don't know. I didn't know the man, but yeah. You're stupid. Everybody's so stupid. And then, then you also worked with Jerry Lewis. Was Jerry Lewis when you worked with him? Was he was he like? Uh... Hey, Lady Jerry Lewis, or is he King of Comedy Jerry Lewis? He was Lewis? King of Comedy Jerry Lewis. Uh, <laughs> he was, he was, he, well, I was very, very close to Richard Belzer. And mm. who was a, you know, just a dear friend. And, he, and, and one day, and he, and he loved Jerry Lewis. And one day he, he called and said, Jerry wants to meet you. <laughs> They're doing a musical version of The Nutty Professor. And he wants to meet you. You know, you got to go down to San Diego and meet him on his yacht. Right. Whoa! And so, oh, great! You know, I bought it. Uh, well, just, um, just a quick question: w was his was his yacht named after one of his movies, or I picture his yacht like the Hey Lady or the, something? No, yeah, or the Jerry Lewis. I have no idea what the yacht was called. <laughs> um, it, it wasn't exactly what you would call like a Jeff Bezos type yacht. Oh, okay, right. The, did you ever read King of Comedy? Did you ever read the biography on Cherry Lewis? No, but you know I've seen that movie a zillion. No, no, times. no. This isn't the movie. This was the, this was the biography about Cherry. No, no, oh, but... read it. It's fascinating. Okay. Basically, somebody found Jerry's receipts <laughs> for yeah. what he had what he had spent in that time. That was a big part of the thing, and what he spent money on it, and the amount of money that Cherry Lewis was getting at that time. It, it dwarfs anything that anybody else is getting now. I mean, he was so rich and he was so, he just spent. He just, he just 
got it and spent. And so, I mean, I'm not saying he was broke or anything like that, but um, towards the end of his career, you know, you go like 10, 15 years, you know, you know, without without it working. I mean, I mean, he, I, I, he, we did talk about King of Comedy. I'm not, not King of Comedy. The Day the Clown Cried. You know his his ill-fated movie. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We're all waiting for the you know, rough cut of that well, to come out. Well, I don't think it'll happen. You know, I, I, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I got to tell you, I'm 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 torn on that. I'm a, I love Harry Shearer's work, you know, but he was the one who kind of opened up this can of worms with the spy article, you know, 30 years ago, where he said Jerry Lewis took me into his thing and showed me a copy of the film and goes on to decimate it, right? But Jerry Lewis had already done that. Jerry Lewis had bought all the copies up, had, you know, basically locked it, publicly said it was a mistake. I've made a mistake. You know, he bought it back. You know, the, he, he, he paid for it. He lost money on it to make sure it wouldn't get out. You know, and I just think it's just like, mm -hmm. what are we all getting out of making fun of this movie that basically, you know, 30 years later, what's his name? You know, Robert but you know roberto that did the same Benini. thing yeah yeah life is beautiful yeah. you know it's, it did the uh -huh. exact same thing maybe he did it better maybe he did it with more guys you know I, i've never understood i thought jerry got like a bad rap on that because he tried to you know keep it out yeah he wasn't the one like going you must put out my movie yeah he, he wasn't like, saying it was great he, he said it was let's terrible. just have yeah. no one ever see this you know and then, ever again. And then harry Shear goes and it's Quite possibly the worst. Yes, we know. He said that. Yeah, He's the even guy, Jerry knows. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> so I've never understood. There's a, there's a sort of snarkiness that mm -hmm. in, in in the comedy community uh, that I, I I don't understand. Of like, you well, know, it's a fraudish choice of seeing someone's failures in like, oh, yeah. genius in France. Ha ha. What about this? Movie? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like, yeah, I, you know, I, I didn't know that well, but I did work with him every day for like a week, and it was really fascinating. You know, to kind of just be be that close up to somebody, and you see, like, you know, he could be really funny, he could be really mean, he could be, he would like go up to his these women who had been working for him for thirty years, you know, they were like in their sixties, and he, you know, with the air horn, <laughs> oh Jerry, so funny. <laughs> you know, what, what, was it because they were working with him? They have to go, Jerry, oh, Jerry, yeah, that's hilarious. There's the ball. You're Jerry, so funny, yeah. Jerry. Oh, you, you, you got me you again. Got you don't work for Jerry without <laughs> telling Jerry how he's the funniest person <laughs> in the world once in a while. So. Who was that, you know, a guy coming from like New Jersey and then find yourself, you know, years later being with a Jerry Lewis? So much of this has been like surreal for me because I really didn't plan on, on doing any of it. I just got very fortunate and got to work with people like Mitch Hurwitz, who, of course, you know, yeah, we'd worked on just about everything together. And then one day he's like, hey, I've written a script for Ron Howard. I've done like 30 drafts of it. And he hands me Arrested Development. And I'm like, um, yeah, I got to get on this. You know, I was, do I was doing My Wife and Kids at the time, uh, the Damon Wayne show. Mm -hmm. And I was like, you know, you know, the joke is Jim left his wife and kids to... <laughs> <laughs> I left my wife and kids to do Arrested Development, uh, which I did. That was just, you know, luck of for me, you know. And also, like, that show was, like, so much about casting. I mean, you know, like, for something to work, like, a lot of things have to work. You know, maybe one or two things can be off or wrong. But, you know, if, let's say on Seinfeld, if they did cast Craig Bierko, you know, it might it might not have worked. Uh -huh. You know, you know, why is Kramer so so bigger and you know better looking? You know, you know, everything has to work. I mean, that show really, you know, with, without Julia Dreyfus, that show doesn't work as well. Uh -huh. I think they all admit that, you know, and they didn't have Julia Dreyfus on. In the, in, in, you know, I have a copy of uh, of the pilot without Julia Dreyfus. Was there a female lead in it, or no. just? Just three dudes. Yeah, it was just three dudes. You know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that dynamics is yeah. Yeah, and it's like oh, right, women. You know. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, oh, so you know, write Larry David and you know, make it a woman, <laughs> right? Which is kind of what he did. Like that. That's kind of been the surreal stuff for me because, like I said, in the eighties, I I lived in the same building and I knew Larry David and Kenny Kramer. And I and I and they did live across the hall from each other. Yeah, and Kenny Crater gives the uh, Seinfeld tours now in New York. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> a, a, a sweet guy, and you know, he, he was a stand-up too. You know, the whole thing—it's not work what I do. You know, 
I've never been in a room going, oh, when can I get home? You know, it's like, you know, you're sitting around with funny people making jokes all day. And what were you taking your inspirations from for, um, you know, when scripting or just in the early days of Arrested Development? You know, we all thought that the show was going to get canceled next week. So we were, you know, Mitch was like, let's just get as much as we possibly can because they're going to cancel us, you know, the first three years. M Mitch basically had two rules, like everybody has to have a story in 22 minutes, which no one has done with, with this many characters. It's way better if the story can overlap uh, and connect. It's like, you know, nice to connect those dominoes. And let's not try to do jokes that we've seen a million times. And, you know, back then, it's just like, you know, I remember the idea of like, wait a minute, we're going to put a blue handprint on the wall. And then in the next episode, without acknowledging it, we'll just see the blue handprint still, you know, like that was, what? <laughs> everything was like, oh, they're so afraid. And, you know, they really had, there had been single camera comedies. I mean, you know, in the 60s, you know, those were all single camera comedies, uh -huh. you know, with, with laugh tracks and whatnot. But um just like a bunch of things went right, you know, Mitch Mitch just came up with these insane characters, and I know totally who they were all based on. The casting was just amazing, you know. I mean, Jessica Walter had never been funnier. Like, who knew that she could be? Because she, she always had to play nice, you know. And all of a sudden, she's playing not nice, and it's like, yes, that's you, <laughs> right? And, and Bateman, at that time, his career was on a downswing, uh -huh. downside. You know, it was, he got. He said, "I got a call back for this, and I got a call back from Verizon, being the uh, can you hear me now? Can you hear me now, guy? You know." Yeah, and he's the glue of the whole show. I mean, the the, the power of the straight man. He's everything um, in the show, cementing yeah. everything. Yeah, you know? yeah. There's no like, but all of them are good. All the, the, there, there's there's not a bad note into it. Then David Schwartz brings this great fun music in. To, you know, to every scene, and then we 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 luck out. We hire the he hires the Russo brothers. Mitch hires the Russo brothers, and you know, basically, it was like, yeah, they're good, but you know, we get an extra camera. Oh, that's great because one of them will always carry the camera. Oh, a free camera man. <laughs> <laughs> because it was, there were a lot of two camera shots, uh -huh. you know, and, and and they were just so good at like a lot of these documentary shows. You you, you cut to the guy and he says his line. The Russo brothers, the guy begins saying his line and the Russo brothers try to find him. So it looks a lot more improvisational than it is. It's the cameraman that doesn't know the script. You know what I mean? Mm. So that's why that show had that feel, you know, uh, towards the end. I mean, it was just, and, and, and we would look at it and, we'd, and we would go, Mitch and I would go, hey, because we had done so much television, which was like, nice, <laughs> comedy, <laughs> you know. We did a lot of sitcoms, a lot of multi-cams. The Golden Girls, to me, had genuine, genuine, real, serious belly laughs in it. Uh, and a couple of other shows. John Larroquette, I'm very proud of doing that show that you can't find anywhere. Then I did some sweet shows, and I did, you know, some, some you know, like, you know, Brotherly Love. And I'm, I'm happy with that show. But it had, like, kids in it. So I was like, I, I don't want to do dirty humor for kids. I was... So wrong. I was so wrong. I should have made it as filthy as I possibly could. But, um, you know, but then to, to actually come come across something and saying, hey, this is really making me laugh. Mm -hmm. did, did it feel a lot more freeing than uh, the previous sitcoms you worked on to work on Arrested Development? No, because we always felt we were about to get fired. Oh, so it was always like, no, oh, yeah, this no, is it, the last the, hurrah. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 the network wouldn't, we never got like, you know, the show's really funny. We got like, uh, you're eight minutes over. You know, we'll, we'll let you be two minutes over in your first cup, but you can't be eight minutes over. Yeah. And you know, and they were, you know, I get it. You know, you know, you know, when the show got awards, that's what saved us. You know, it's like, well, you know, we got we won best comedy. You can't cancel a show that's just won best comedy. Although they tried, <laughs> they they definitely tried. The word I heard is Rupert Murdoch was not a fan of the show, mm -hmm. and I'm like. Good. Who can? Yeah. Yeah. Well, Rupert Murdoch. He's, he's There's a guy who knows comedy. Yeah, yeah, right. You know. what, what elements do you think makes a perfect uh, Arrested Development sketch, just in broad stroke terms? Oh, you know, the, the, the ones that have all the cast members, if the story totally works. Like, it's so funny. Like, Mitch and I were, he threw a little party for me the other night because it was my birthday. And we we're talking around, and somebody said something along those lines, like, you know, I was eating at this restaurant called Mother's. And I went, Mother's? 
<laughs> and Mother's. I go, who would name a restaurant Mother's? I mean, don't you want like a positive association when you're coming up with a name for a re- Mother's? Who wants to go to a place where, you know, you're abusive? And you know, we just like went into like an arrest development run. And I do think that we had that, you know, you know, he's got that sense of humor of this like, yeah, that hasn't been done yet. I don't think that joke, particular joke has been done yet. It, it, it's probably out there somewhere, but it's not like a trope yet. But like, let's use something like that. So, but like, like a perfect episode where, uh, was where there's all this stuff, you know, happens and you laugh your ass off. And once, once a character has made his audience laugh, they like that character. The whole thing about unlikable characters is like, it doesn't matter if they make the character laugh, mm-hmm. you know? Uh, you know, the old lady on, on Golden Girls, if you just have to live with her, she's not a likable person. She insults you, she insults your size, and you know, you're ugly. <laughs> but she makes you laugh, so that makes her likable, in my book. Yeah. Anyway, and I think that we, we, we use that. And then if there's just, you know, Will Arnett could break your heart, <laughs> you know, because his whole character is so insecure He's like the, the the neglected son. He should he should he should be the smart son. He's not. Jason's the smart son. You know the, the kid breaks your heart. You know the only person who can never break your heart is the old lady Jessica. You know, but she was our villain. Yeah. You know she's she's the reason why everyone's you know so fucked up in my opinion. Yeah. So just a few last questions here. What do you think either Arrested Development's place is in comedy history or your place in comedy history? Oh, I have no place in comedy history. That's a <laughs> ridiculous, absurd question. Wait, did we have, we just talked about it the whole hour. Well, I have a few stories, but like, trust me, I'm not going to write a book and I'm not going to, you know, and I also like you. I'm a, I'm a fan of your works. Um, but I, I remember like, you know, when uh, we would we 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 did put like a lot of time, especially Mitch. He not only wrote it; he basically was on set for most of the shooting, and then um, most importantly in um, in editing. Not that I'm not knocking editors, but your as uh, your show's gonna be as funny as your editor. And it, have you ever met an editor? They're not the funniest guys in the world. So sometimes they might not take the right take. They, they use sometimes like they'll take a broad take or something like that. And I think a lot of showrunners just go, "Oh, I don't want to deal with editing because it's so repetitive and it's so, you know, mind-numbingly boring." But that's where you get the jokes. Mm-hmm. And you know, and and there would be like take take five frames off, put two back on. You know, I mean that's how attuned Mitch was. In editing, but I would say what what what, what arrested will be is I I think more when I, I as we were writing it I, I would say you know this will show might not ever get a giant audience, but um, people who want to get into comedy this will be their favorite show this will be the show that helps them say oh my god I can do that oh I didn't see that coming I didn't see that coming or wow what a great way of doing that. And, and and that has kind of proven to be true. I know a lot of young writers who are like, oh my God, arrested. And it's like, good, it's done its job. It's indoctrinated another person into comedy. And right now, I can, I can sit back and I can watch, you know, I mean, comedy has, has gotten much better. The hard comedy jokes, the multi-cam things, you know, we made about a million of them. Maybe, you know, maybe it's time we put that formula to rest, you know, or find, you know, or find a new way of doing it. But, um, if, if Arrested has a legacy, it's going to be like it inspired a lot of good comedy writers. Jim, thank you so much. I, I appreciate the stories, and uh, it was good to uh, catch up with you. It was This was fun. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, I enjoyed it as well. Take care, my friend. Okay. Friday. Okay. You too, Bob. Bye. Bye. And that wraps up today's episode of Comedy History 101. You got schooled in comedy. Also, a special thanks and shout out to my friend John Posell who edited today's episode. And once again, remember to like, subscribe, and comment on Comedy History 101. Give us a few stars on iTunes or Spotify, or you can comment directly on our site, comedyhistory101.com, such as the listeners who commented on our episode on Moms Mabley with Rhonda Hansom. A Garland L. Thompson Jr. writes... A very enjoyable interview. Yay for Moms Mabley. Thank you, Harmon and Rhonda. A Ganel Jasper writes, I thoroughly appreciated this interview. I received an education regarding Moms Mabley's life 
and career, and Rhonda shared her very nuanced experience of bringing it all to life on the stage. And a Brian C. Saunders writes, and this is in all caps, awesome interview, dot, 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 awesome show, dot, dot, dot. Not one, not two, but three, three exclamation points. Well, thank you very much, Byron. And also the quick plugs on Thursday, October 19th, 9 p.m. at Young Ethel's in Park Slope. Come see my show, That 80s Improv Challenge, Fast Food Training Video Edition. And on October 1st, at the Santa Cruz Comedy Festival, I'll be presenting my show, AI vs. Human Roast Battle. And on October 6th, 7 p.m., at the People's Improv Theater, I will also be presenting my show, AI vs. Human Roast Battle. And you can find out all about these dates on my site, HarmanLeon.com, or on the social medias, at HarmanLeon. And until next time, bye-bye. You're stupid. Everybody's so stupid. I'm trying to use the phone. Excuse me. Comedy History 101.